about being here at King's is that all around us, uh, whether it's a fellow peer, fellow student, or a teacher, uh, you can be deeply impacted by a bunch of different voices on campus. Uh, today, I'm going to share with you a voice that's been deeply encouraging to me throughout the year, and I know to many of the fellow teachers that are in this room. Uh, a special gift, not a guest to King's, but maybe unfamiliar to some of you. This morning, uh, Mr. Skinner, the Director of Instrumental Arts, is going to share with us this moment. Before he speaks, let me pray for him real quick, and then I ask that you're always respectful to me, be respectful to Mr. Skinner as well, as he leads us this morning. Let, us, let me pray. Father God, we're so grateful for your word. We're thankful that every time we open it, every time that we let it examine us, we are changed. So I ask this morning that you would just continue what you've done so far. Maybe in this room um, there's discouragement, most likely there's discouragement. Maybe there's fatigue, maybe there's tiredness. But Lord, we ask that you break through our lack of attention. We thank you for your word which constantly hears us. I pray this morning for Mr. Shinner. I thank you for the wisdom, for the joy that he shared, for the encouragement that he shared with so many on staff here and so many students as well. So I pray that you be with his words, speak through them, be with our minds and think through them, and be with our wills and bend them to your own for the sake of your glory here at King's Academy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please welcome Mr. Shinner. Thank you. Thank you to all those band students that I just heard. Uh, <laughs> your GPA is secure. So, um, Mr. Kimball asked me last year if I would be willing to speak, and um, I kind of made a commitment uh, to the Lord that if anybody at the King's Academy asked me to minister in any way, that I would do so, whether I really wanted to or not. Because if I have an opportunity and I've been given something, then I want to be able to give that back. So this morning I want to talk to you about divine appointments. Divine appointments. Do you know what a divine appointment is? I heard a couple of notes. So a divine appointment is when God makes the appointment. Thanks for that. I'm dying up here. No. So, yeah, but that's basically what it is. It's when God says, okay, I'm going to bring these two people together. Or I'm going to make this scenario happen. And it happens under different circumstances. It happens by sometimes um, tremendous uh, overcoming of fear and, and obedience. Sometimes it happens really without us even knowing that it's going to happen. It really doesn't have a lot to do with us. But I want to talk to you about that this morning, divine appointments. And I want to also share some stories with you because um, what I've discovered, and I was raised in a Christian home. My dad was a pastor. He was a missionary to the West Indies for five years. Um, I grew up in a Christian environment. But, but I can tell you, I'm, I'm 53 years old. I know. I know what you're thinking. There's no way he's 53. <laughs> We're not sure which direction, but we're, he's not 53. But what I can tell you is that the words in this book are true, and they can be counted on in all kinds of circumstances. And I want to just encourage you with that, with, with those words and, and some stories this morning. I want to just read a couple of verses of Scripture. Jeremiah 10, 23 says, Lord, I know that people's lives are not their own. This is an important lesson to learn in life. I'm still learning it. Because sometimes I just want to do my own thing. Regardless of whatever God wants me to do. I want to do whatever I want to do. I don't really, you know, I, I want to do what's comfortable to me. I want to do what's convenient to me. But what I've learned is that my life is not really my own. It's not really my own. You guys doing alright over here? I always sit down here and I never like to feel like Sometimes I feel like my life is my own. But what, I, what Jeremiah said is, Lord, I know that people's lives are not their own. It is not for them to direct their steps. So there are times when we have to do something because God is leading us to do it. And God can lead you in many, many different ways. God is very big, He's very powerful, and He can do it however He wants. 
How many of you feel like you've ever been led by God to do something? Or to not do something? Just curious. Raise a silent hand. I, I learned that in elementary class. I like that. Um, so, I want to tell you a story, and, and I brought some notes for this story. It's not my own story. I'm going to share my own, some, some of my own story. But I, but I brought some notes because I didn't want to miss any of the details. But this story really had a, a, a profound impact on me. Um, a minister was teaching a conference on, on evangelism, on leading people to the Lord. And after he did the teaching, then they went out, and this was pretty hardcore. They went door to door. Like, I don't know if you've ever done anything door to door, but it's hard. Like, you don't want to know. Anybody sell anything for school door to door? It's not easy. Yeah. So they went, they, they were going to go door to door and try to lead people to the Lord, just knock on their door and talk to them about Jesus and lead them to the Lord. That's pretty hardcore right there. So they had groups. It was a group of men, and, and one of the guys ended up being solo. And so the guy that was teaching, the pastor that was teaching, said, look, we'll pair up, we'll go with you, we'll go in your car. So they spent all day, and they literally found no one. Everyone was like hardened, atheist, like nothing. They got nothing. And so they're about ready to head back to... Uh, you know, the headquarters or wherever they were, and he was feeling, the, the, the pastor was feeling pretty discouraged because here I am teaching on evangelism, and we got a big goose egg right now. I get, I get to go back and tell everybody that I don't know how to do what I'm doing. And so, just as they were about to, uh, you know, make their way back, the pastor said he just felt in his heart that they were supposed to stop at this house that was up on the hill. And then he felt like if they stopped there, that somebody was going to be led to the Lord. And so they drove up to the house, and this house was not a beautiful house. It was a run-down old house. So they get out, and well, the guy that was with him, who was a big businessman, 6'5 businessman, and he said, I'm not so sure this is a good idea. This house doesn't look so savory. It doesn't look so great. But he said, no, I really feel like we need to do this. So they got out, and they knocked on the door, and nobody answered the door, but they kept hearing this loud rock and roll coming from somewhere around the house. So the guy's like, let's just go. And he's like, no, we're, we're, they, they didn't just leave the radio play. There's somebody here. So they started going around back. And the guy's like, this is not a good idea. The big, the big dude said, this is not a good idea. And so they went around back. And there was a, they could tell this is where the music was coming from. And there was a big eight or nine foot uh, wood fence. So they couldn't see anything through it. So they get ready to go in. And the guy's like, this is not good. I'm telling you, he told him three times, this is not a good idea. So he just, the pastor opens the door, walks in, and before he could realize what was going on, he realized that he's surrounded by a motorcycle gang. About eight or nine guys, about five or six women. And uh, he said, this was like the real deal motorcycle gang. This was not like weekend warriors. This was not like lawyers in leather. This was like real hardcore, like these were bad dudes. And he said, the guy standing nearest the door had a tattoo on his arm that said, born to kill. <laughs> and, um, but it was too late. He was already in. So the music is playing. So he marches over to where the stereo is, turns the power off, and says, I'm here to talk to you about Jesus. I'm thinking, I never would have gotten out of the car. So this is the kind of boldness that I don't have. So he said, and, and of course he was terrified. Don't get, don't get me wrong, the, the minister was terrified to be here. These guys were not welcoming. They were not looking like warm and friendly. Um, so he starts preaching to them. And he kind of gets done with his bit like as quick as he could. And he said he had his head down and his eyes closed the whole time because if he got shot, he didn't want to see it coming. And so he finishes and he says, now when I open my eyes, if anybody wants to receive Christ and wants to have your life changed, then raise your hand. And he said, he said, I finished preaching, I opened my eyes, and he said they were literally just looking at me with their mouths hang hanging open like, what planet did this guy come from? And so... He doesn't stop there. He walks up to each one of the motorcycle gang dudes and asks them individually if they want to receive Christ. And he said, I have never been cursed out more efficiently, more prolifically, more 
when, when the, he said, these guys cursed with such great ease, it was phenomenal. And he was cursed out by these people, and so he realizes at that moment, I was not led by God in here. I just came in here because I didn't want to go back with a goose egg. I just came in here on my own. And he said, so at that point, my biggest goal is to get out of there alive. And he said, just about the time he turned to go, he heard a little voice. Said, hey, mister, what about me? Turns around, and behind the choppers was a pool table covered up with a, a tarp. And a little boy crawled out from under the pool table, and he had his hand up. He said, what about me, mister? You didn't, you didn't, you didn't see my hand. I want to receive Jesus. And so he goes over to the little boy, and he kneels down, and he starts to pray with him. And one of the women there cursed him out and said, get away from him. He doesn't know what you're talking about. Get away from him. And the guy that was standing by the gate, who had the tattoo that said, born to kill, said, shut up, woman. These were bad dudes, I told you. He said, shut up, woman. This ain't for, this ain't for me. I ain't going to do it, and you ain't going to do it, but you're not going to stop the kid. And that little boy received the Lord that day. He prayed with him, he gave him a little New Testament Bible, wrote his name in it. And he said when they left and got in the car, the six foot five businessman was just weeping. And he said, you know, you're supposed to follow up when you do evangelism. So he went back a few days later, and they, were, they all moved out, they were gone. So that opportunity, that divine appointment, would not have occurred at that moment had he not been obedient, had he not been obedient in that circumstance. Now, I don't know about you, but there's a several layers of challenge that probably would have made me go home, made me stop. But you know, the scripture says that the angels in heaven rejoice over one person that comes to the Lord. Did you know that? Did you know the scripture says that? One person, the angels in heaven rejoice. So. But it's not always about that. It's not always about being evangelistic and fearless and, and standing up in the face of challenge or being cursed out. Sometimes God just does it with, this, with the most quiet voice. Elijah learned that God speaks with a still, small voice. I'm going to tell you a story that I experienced myself. My wife and I, we're going to go do some, run some errands just, you know, on Saturday, just nothing interesting. Go to the dry cleaners, go to the, you know, grocery store, whatever. And I remember, and we needed to stop by my parents' house. And I told my wife before we left the house, I said, I want to make sure we stop by my mom and dad's house first. I didn't have any special feeling or leading of the Lord or inclination or anything. I just said, I want to stop by. We got in the car. And I said to her again, I said, I want to make sure that we stop by mom and dad's house first. Again, I don't know why I said it. I don't know why I did it. We pulled up into my parents' driveway, and the car was sitting out in front of the house. And as I walked out of my car, I walked up, and I saw my dad. It looked like he was looking under the undercarriage of the car, like laying on his back looking under the car. And as I approached, I realized he wasn't looking under the car. He wasn't looking at anything. He was unconscious. And so I ran up and I called his name three times. I said it loud. I said, Dad! 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 And he came to. His, there, was, there was a iron uh, railing around the patio of the, their front door. And his head was kind of laying in between two, two iron bars. And my mom must have heard me. She did hear me. And she came running. And, and she was on the inside of the railing, and she said to my dad, she said, are you all right? She said, does anything hurt? He said, my head hurts. And so she took, her, took his head in her hand, and she said, oh, my goodness, he's bleeding. And so what had happened, at least what we think happened, is as he got out of the car, he must have blacked out, and he spun around, and the corner of the door was very sharp and pointed and cut an artery in the back of his head, not a vein, but an artery. You know anything about arteries? You'll bleed out in a matter of moments. And it was a hot day, too. And so 
We did what the best we could. We wrapped a towel around his head. We called the paramedics. And not to be graphic, but let me just tell you, it was horrific. It, I mean, when the paramedics took, the, took him away on the, on the, on the thing, uh, it, it, it was just, it, blood was just dripping off of it, just dripping off. And they had wrapped his head multiple times. It was just dripping. And later my mom said to me, she said, you know, I heard a thud. But I thought it was the garage door. But she said, I now realize it was him hitting, hitting the ground, hitting the railing. And she said, it wasn't 60 seconds before I heard your voice saying, Dad, Dad. So I literally drove up within a minute of that occurring. And had I not been there, my mom would not have been alerted. My dad would have died right there on the spot in a matter of moments. It was a divine appointment. He had me there. I wasn't obedient. I didn't do anything. The only thing I can tell you is that there was something inside of me that made me insist to go to their house first. Because if we'd gone anywhere else first, he would have been dead. This was a divine appointment. You understand what I'm saying? So sometimes God speaks in a very, very quiet, subtle way. He'll speak to you in the form of an inclination you have inside. Sometimes he'll speak to you in, in profound ways. If you want some homework, and I know how much you want some homework, go. I was supposed to, supposed to help you out there. Um, go read Acts chapter 10, the story of Cornelius and Peter. And you will see a divine intersection that caused the gospel to be delivered to the Gentiles. It's one of the reasons that we have heard the gospel and that we have received the gospel. And it happened way back then. And it, and it required, and it was, they were, both of those men were visited by angelic messengers. But Peter had to overcome a lot of tradition, religious tradition, in order to go to the Gentiles and, and speak to them, and even be in their house with them. Anyway, go read in Acts chapter 10, if you're so inclined. If you want to read about another divine appointment from the scriptures. Psalm 37, 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Are ordered by the Lord. And I tell you what I've found in my life. i found most often that I look back and I see that God was ordering my steps more than I realize He's ordering my steps at the moment. I look back and I see it. Even, even finding my wife was a divine appointment. My dad used to preach in, uh, all over the country, and he, was preach, he used to preach many, many years ago in Detroit, Michigan, in a church there. And it turns out that my wife's family used to go from Ohio to Detroit to visit their mother, my wife's grandparents, and they would go to church there, and they probably heard my dad speak. And when my, my brother-in-law, my wife's husband, was a professional golfer, and, she, and the grandmother said, if you're ever in West Palm Beach, if you're ever in South Florida, go to such and such a church, my dad's church. And that's what he did, and that's where he met my sister. By the way, my sister is married to my wife's brother. That'll, that'll get you thinking. It's all quite legal, I assure you. <laughs> brother and sister, brother and sister, they got married. In fact, I met my wife at their wedding. I was dating somebody else at the time. And wishing I wasn't. <laughs> yeah, true story. So I look back and I see how God ordered, if Jeff, my brother-in-law, hadn't come to my dad's church, he might have never met my sister, and then I would have never met Lisa, who's a fifth grade teacher at the King's Academy. Uh, and, and so I look back and I see how God was ordering steps, and I had no idea. God was creating divine appointments. Romans 8.14 says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you. Let me ask you something. Do you know the plans that God has for you? Because they're probably better than your plans. They're probably grander than your plans. 
This is what I believe about the human condition. You know how an engineer will design a machine, like a lawnmower, every time I buy a piece of equipment, it comes with a booklet and it tells you how often to change the oil or what kind of... Now, if I want to say to the engineer, hey, I'm not going to use that kind of oil, man. I'm going to use whatever I want to use. I'm not going to change the oil of my car every 3,000 miles. I'm going to change it whenever I feel like it. Well, I can, but I do so to my own disadvantage, to my own peril. So what I've learned is that God is the engineer of mankind. God made man. God created us. And when I realize that it is to my advantage to do as he directs, then my life is better. And, I, and what I find occurring is more and more divine appointments. Not, not uh, disappointments, but divine appointments. Because when we go and do things that we want to do, and it's really not what God wants us to do, and listen, believe me, folks, friends, I was a teenager once. I've done many, many a thing that God didn't want me to do, and I knew I was doing it, and He didn't want me to do it. But how many of you would like to know what plans God has for you? How many of you aren't quite sure what you want to major in, but you feel like you got to say so because it's not cool to not know, even though we know that 80% of freshmen change their major, but we, we, you know, we feel like we got to know. But you know what? You can know. You can know. God says, I know the plans I have for you. And the interesting thing about that idea of plans is it's a specific strategy. A specific strategy. God gave me a specific strategy, and it saved my dad's life. Go to his house first. So what I've learned, my young friends, is that when I do what God wants me to do, when I seek to be led by His Spirit, my life is better. And other people's lives are better. You understand what I'm saying? And, and if God has a plan for you, and you want to know it, think how much more He wants you to know the plan. I know the plans that I have for you. Specific strategy that I have for you to prosper you. And not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. I'll share one more story with you. I have five kids. Um, where's Madeline? Where's Madeline? There's my, there's my third child, fourth child. It's hard to keep them straight. She used to be my baby. Don't worry, I'm not going to tell any stories, honey. She used to be my baby, and on my wife's 47th birthday, she took a pregnancy test and discovered that she was pregnant. 47th birthday. Say it with me, 47. People are like, wow. I'm like, yeah, that's what we said. We didn't know God had that plan in mind, but you know what? She's in second grade at the King's Academy, and she's been a blessing to us since the day she was born. Just joy, just comfort. Somehow she's our comfort baby. But my second son, Josh, had spina bifida when he was born. He's been in a wheelchair for 24 years. But when he was young, we used to go to the Shriners Hospital twice a year. And I won't go into all the medical stuff, but they wanted to do an operation on his hips. And if, if you know anything about the Shriners, all the medical care there is for free. The Shriners raise the money, and when you go there, it's all for free. It's quite a wonderful thing. And so we were scheduled for a major hip operation on this little guy. And my wife was quite pregnant with, with our next child, our fourth child, and I was about to enter band camp season, which is like, you know, football season for a coach. It's like a really busy time. And my son was going to have to be in this big, heavy cast for, for six weeks, and my wife was going to have to carry him around, pregnant out to here, and we were just like, man, this is not good. But we just felt a little hesitation about it. See, this is what I'm talking about. There's no real real method or, or uh, way that God leads you. Sometimes it's just the way you feel. And, and, but we were already scheduled for this surgery. And my wife's like, well, what do we do about it? I said, well, we're not going to go in there and tell these people who are going to give us a free surgery. Um, we just feel like we're not going to do it. Because that would not, that would just be weird. And nobody likes weird Christians, okay? Be, like, be, be reasonable and responsible and normal, right? I mean, our beliefs are weird enough, you know? I mean, we believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. That's pretty weird to some people. So, Anyway, I said, look, this is what's going to happen. God's going to have to let us out. If he wants us to not have this, if this is, from, if this is him leading us, then he's going to have to give us an out. 
And so, so my son has checked into the hospital, they've done all the blood work, they've done everything, and at about 7 p.m. the night before the surgery, the surgeon comes by. We weren't expecting him. And he said, hey, how are you guys doing? And we're like, well, we're doing okay. And he asked this question, how do you feel about this surgery? My wife and I, our ears perked up. How do we feel about it? I said, well, to tell you the truth, it's not a really great time. My wife's pregnant. Son's going to have to be in this big, heavy cast. I'm going to be gone a lot. It's just really not a good timing for us. He said, well, you know, it's interesting that you should say that because I checked with the other surgeons on this case, and they all, we all agree that it's, that it's too aggressive for us to do this surgery. We don't feel like we should do it. So if you don't feel like we should do it, then we won't do it. And I'm like, thank you, Lord. You gave me an out. You gave us an out. So, really, my whole message to you today is that God wants to have a divine appointment with you. He wants to make you meet the right person that you're supposed to meet. Hey, girls, would you like to meet the right person that you're supposed to meet? Well, it seems like I may have opened a can of worms there. Hey, guys, would you like to meet the right person? Right? So listen, I'm here to tell you that if you want God's highest and best for you, He wants it even more. And all you have to do is open your heart, open your heart to that reality. Open your heart and say, God, I want you to lead me. See, sometimes we come to school and we think, i got a test, and i got this homework, and whatever, and we don't stop to think, I'm the same way. I go, well, i got to teach this, and i got to get this concert ready, and i got to do this. And what we're not thinking about is the fact that God might have a plan for us today that's a divine appointment. And I frankly think that we miss some appointments because we're not listening. What do you guys think? Hey, there's my alarm. That means my 25 minutes are up. I hope that you heard something today that's going to be of value to you. I'm here to tell you that my own life, I can see God's hand at work. I can see divine appointments that He has set up for me that I knew nothing about. And my prayer for you is that you will experience the same thing. Let me turn this alarm off and let's pray. Lord, I thank you for these students. I thank you for this faculty. Lord, I ask that by your Spirit you would speak. In, in ways that only you can speak to each one of them. That you would penetrate our busyness, you would, you would penetrate our distraction, you would penetrate our unbelief, you would penetrate our walls and barriers, and that you would speak to our hearts. And that, Father, you would create divine appointments for us. Appointments that we know that you made for us. Lord, I ask that you would lead the student body in their lives, that you would cause them to make decisions that would honor you, that you would lead them in ways that they can't even fathom right now, they can't imagine the plans that you have, plans for a hope and a future far greater and grander than we could even hope for ourselves. Lord, I thank you for this school, I thank you for this special place, this special environment, I thank you for this opportunity to share a little bit of my story and the stories that I've experienced in my walk of faith with you. Lord, bless them. Keep them. Guide them. It's a crazy world. Keep them. Keep their hearts. Cause them to show up for the appointments that you have planned. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.